they will sign off right now if you go to a million thirty thousand. We got a deal at a million thirty, whatever that number is, right? So there can still be a negotiation that happens yeah. uh, to to really understand if the buyers are at their full all in number, and that's the key. You just want to make sure that any any offer on the table is the best is truly the best offer. Insert TikTok troll who now blames real estate agents for increasing prices here. <laughs> yeah, well, cotton. Excuse me, TikTok troll. That's our job. Well, that's it. But I, my point Sorry. to them is we, on a micro level, we influence prices. But on a macro, it all comes down to supply and demand. All right. Hello. Welcome to episode 164 of KT Confidential, the real estate podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Ariel. He's Adrian. Welcome. This is our first podcast of 2022. 2022, a new year. I am very much looking forward to this new calendar, this new year, this new, I'll call <laughs> it new new lease on life. And not, not to be um, a Debbie Downer, but I, I believe we probably said the same thing this time last year. And now we're <laughs> like, oh, I, I, I could be happy if this year never happened. That was a good year well, for many things, but obviously came with many challenges also. Crazy to think that we are closing in on two years of this pandemic, two years yeah. of, you know, um, non-normalcy. But, uh, you know, 2021 for me personally wasn't a very good year with a bunch of people passing in our family and... Uh, you know, uh, obviously lots of restrictions still. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think the, I think the mental component of it all and, um, you know, not, not having the same interactions with people, whether it's personally or business related, right? Like we've talked yeah. about being able to hang out in the KT studio and do some training sessions and, and just having people here to learn and feed off of each other, those type of things, but also with clients, right? I mean, client interactions have been very, very different in the last two years. And, um, and obviously now with, uh, with this new strain and uh, the numbers going up, we don't know what the, at least the first quarter is going to entail. I'm really curious to see what these, uh, numbers, both, you know, uh, infected and hospitalizations and all of that, what they're going to look like after the holidays. Cause usually the, yeah. you'll see a spike, right? Um, this so. is the first time that I can remember in the last census began, um, that I've been, uh, a number of people I personally know have now contracted, uh, yes. the virus. So that's interesting, but Fortunately, nobody's been hit very bad by it. It just seems like a, a very infectious version of the flu uh, for the people that I, I know. So that's nice to see uh, that nobody I'm aware of has been affected that bad. It's just, uh, oh, and then they were also saying that they, <clears throat> they anticipate everybody will get it at some point. So we shall see. Yeah, maybe it'll become like the common flu. <laughs> Anyways, uh, don't want to talk about COVID. Um, no, certainly not. Uh, do you want to talk anything about uh, the holidays and what happened in the real estate market? Because I, I kind of want to touch on that before we get into uh, the real topic. So today we're talking about irrevocable times on an offer. So what does an irrevocable mean in a real estate offer, whether it's an agreement to purchase and sale or agreement to lease? Um, there's what's called an irrevocable date, an irrevocable time. We're going to talk about what that actually means and how it affects you as a buyer, as a seller, as a tenant, as a landlord. So we'll touch on that. And there's also a misunderstanding behind it, even as far as real estate, from a real estate agent perspective, as far as how it works. So it's, clearly it's a topic that needs to be discussed. Yes. So especially if you're a new realtor, listen up. If you're um, even a, se a lot of seasoned realtors that I talk to sometimes in negotiations, um, you know, the there is, which is so odd to me, but uh, they have this 
gray area in their head that uh, we want to clarify and make sure that everybody knows what they're doing. So we're going to talk about that today. What I wanted to chat about, though, or, or just touch on for the viewing audience is... And the know, listening audience, we don't want to leave you out. Correct. Sorry, I apologize. I, I don't very often watch the podcast back, but I very often listen to them back because it's just so easy. Apple podcast on, on my car, play in the car. And uh, when I'm on a drive, I'll, uh, I'll throw it on and listen to it back. Um, we had a chat a couple of podcasts ago. If you didn't watch it, we were predicting 2022 and what the real estate market is going to see in this year. Um, over the last week, there have been some news publications that uh, have articles that came out that would pretty well agree with what we were saying and the hot market will continue. But I've been reading. But what is interesting to me, and I don't know if you noticed that in the last couple of weeks, typically, and I, and I spoke about this with our realtors on our team, we usually see the activity go down for listings. And that makes sense, right? Like people aren't going to be listing their home, you know, especially if they celebrate Christmas, you don't really want to be listing your home during that time. And unless an absolute need for it, you're going to hold off until sometime in the new year, or you would have planned and done it beforehand. Uh, so we weren't expecting a lot of listings and there weren't. Right. So we're now in the new year with a tremendously low supply, which goes to what we were talking about in terms of prices and the market. Very low supply, still high demand, going to push the prices higher. Very simple economics. But what was interesting to me is usually during the Christmas break, and, you know, I guess every year is a little bit different but this one stood out to me because over the past 10 11 years i've always noticed that our 1800 number uh my personal number my email everything increased in terms of activity from a buyer perspective and also sellers that are anticipating selling in the first quarter and I did not have as much of that activity this year. No, I had a little bit, but not not what we would normally see. Right. Um, and usually it, like in past, and I can't really recall last year because last year is really an anomaly, but, um, or I should say 2020. But prior to that, like 2019, 2018, 2017, during that Christmas break, I always had a bunch of sellers inquiring to set up appointments because they were planning on selling in the spring or in February, or they purchased a new construction home and wanted to get their ducks in order. And because they had time off during that period, that's when they would uh, plan all of that, make those calls and make those arrangements. And I did not get the same volume. Our 1-800 number uh, traffic for, for that was definitely down. So I started thinking about that and I thought, well, you know what? That's not surprising. Why is it not surprising? Because now people work from home and they're working virtually. So, you know, they might be quote unquote working, but they'll have time now, 10, 15, 20 minutes during the day to pick up the phone or make those personal email uh, interactions that they, you know, if they had to go into the office or, or you know, whatever, um, that they probably wouldn't have had the time to do before. So, so I think people's personal time is now getting spread out more so than it did. So during that uh, holiday season, um, people, you know, just enjoyed it relaxing and eating and drinking and whatever. Um, so I think that was my correlation for why that happened. Um, but it also resonates that supply will be low. Supply, I think for sure, consistently. Extremely low, especially in the first quarter. 
Um, so if you have, like, here's my warning call to sellers out there. The first quarter of 2022 is going to be an extreme seller's market. And my warning call to buyers is if you're buying in the first quarter, try and do it as early in the quarter as you can, because the prices are going to shoot up quite a bit. In Even the next right month. now. I mean, if yep. they can, if something's on the market right now, like <clears throat> forget the time off, you need to get back out there and looking. Yep. And it's interesting. The last, not that this is a big enough sampling to make any uh, determination or uh, opinion on what's happening. But the last two phone calls I got, one was um, a referral to us from an, an ex, from an existing client who is moving into a new construction home in the new year. Um, and they want us to potentially rent their house out and manage it. And they are keeping it. Uh, the other phone call I got was from existing clients who are moving to Florida. Um, and they also want to keep their house here and rent it out, uh, while they are, uh, in Florida for a new job placement. So, uh, I mean, not again, not that I would make an opinion, uh, uh, on the market as a whole because of that, but it's interesting that I get two phone calls like that from people who don't want to unload their houses right now, which tells me that they obviously have expectations of the market being strong in the long run um and they want to hold on to them and rent them out yeah versus before uh you had i i saw less of that personally oh for sure well i mean even from an affordability standpoint you know you got to question that but you know even you and i had that discussion with our brassard reno so if you've yeah. been following us uh, on Instagram, you know that uh, we've got a rental property that we're currently renovating and are planning on putting on the market for sale. And in initial discussions, we were talking about listing it in January. And um, now we might just hold off a little bit until, you know, until that that market comes up to that peak a bit and um, wait for that low supply situation and um and capitalize on that opportunity as a seller so um you know people are holding off maybe a month two months maybe a year two years or or maybe just holding it um because the predictions are in you know province of ontario even in the country yeah real estate is going to continue to appreciate because of supply and demand so anyways um Looking forward to this year, my friend. Uh, lots of big goals, lots of big projections, lots of new things coming down the pipe again for KT. Um, so this is uh, this is this is going to be a big year. Let's get into the topic, episode one sixty four of KT Confidential. I will start off with the most common question or item on the purchase agreement that people question, and that is the irrevocable section. So what is an irrevocable? Um, how does it affect you? How does it play a role in the whole offer process? So uh, if you look at an offer, an agreement of purchase and sale, there's a section where you input a date and time to which your offer is irrevocable. In Ontario, and it's page one of the agreement of purchase. That's right. And to sum it up in terms of what that means, you are stating that your offer to purchase property A or whatever property it is you're offering on, your offer is valid until that date and time. If the seller accepts your offer without making any changes, you've bought a house as long as it's signed off within that time. If if they make any changes, that irrevocability is really irrelevant at that point. They then sign it back to you, saying it's now irrevocable by them, the seller. Whereas when you sent it to them, it was irrevocable by you, which means you could not revoke it. Unless that's confusing. That was a little bit confusing. Irrevocable. You cannot use. That's when, that's when the offer expires. That's right. Irrevocable by definition, dictionary.com, not to be revoked or recalled. 
unable to be repealed. So there you go. It's unalterable. Yes. It's irrevocable until that time. So if you as a buyer submit an offer today on Monday and it is irrevocable until 11.59 p.m., that means at 12 a.m., actually at 11.59.01, <laughs> one second past that time, that offer is null and void. Um, there's a huge, huge, first of all, I don't know that a lot of the general public knows this or has explained it properly. Because no. I've had many calls over the years where a, a realtor will submit an offer. Let's say it's 3 p.m. And the irrevocable is 7 p.m. I'll get a call at 5 p.m. that the buyers have changed their mind. Cold feet. And they would like to retract their offer. Do you understand what irrevocable means? Do you understand what that contract means and why that irrevocable time and date are in place? That's right. Well, and for the record too, uh, well, there's a few scenarios where it comes into play. There, some people will submit multiple offers on multiple properties, more so with leases, I think, than purchases. But I'm sure it happens with both. People just want to get a house. They're competing against all these houses. Maybe Especially maybe if you have offer night on the same night. Right. Yeah, exactly. So if there's two properties you're considering and they're both taking offers on the one night, you don't want to pick or choose which one you're going to go for. So you submit an offer on both. Now, you, if you submit an offer on both and both are accepted, as long as they're accepted within that time period of the irrevocable, you have bought two houses. You can't. Now, there are cases where people do that and then they say, oh, okay, I'm not going to, I'll take property A over property B. You can't do that. Now, you, you may get away with it, but there have been cases where people were sellers took buyers to court because they didn't follow through with the agreement and didn't provide a deposit. And there are known cases where the sellers won and uh, were rewarded uh, a sum of money. I don't know how much in particular, but a substantial amount of money that it certainly wasn't worth the buyers doing that. So you have to be very careful. It's a legal binding document and there are ramifications that come with it if you don't fulfill your side of the agreement. Now, one thing I see happen quite often as a listing agent, when we get an offer, again, go into that scenario. Let's say we receive the offer at 3 p.m., irrevocable 7 p.m. If we have not responded by 7 p.m., like as it gets to like 6, 6.30, the buyer's agent is calling you know, asking what's going on? What's going on? Are you going to accept the offer? Or are you going to sign it back? The misconception is that we have to sign it back by 7 right. p.m., which is not the case. No. The it, it, only time that that irrevocable time is relevant is if you are accepting the offer as it was presented. Right. I would say it's uh, at a minimum or at a, at a maximum, I suppose, it's a professional courtesy to provide an update by that time. Sure. But there's no legal obligation of any, in any way, shape, or form. Right. But I've, I just, have had realtors leading up to that deadline. Yeah. And I would, as a courtesy, say, we're not accepting it as is, but we are going to sign it back. And they'll be like, well, it's 6.59. When are you going to send it to me? Right. Right? Thinking yeah, right. that I had to have it back to them by 7 p.m. Right. Now, what happens in that case, if it's now 7.01 and the sellers want to counter? the So the initial offer is now expired. 7 o'clock is gone. That initial offer from buyer to seller has expired. Now it's an offer from the seller 
back to the buyer. So if your offer was a million dollars, the seller didn't accept it. And now at 730, the seller wants to counter offer and send you an offer as the buyer back at 1,100,000. Now the irrevocable will change to have it irrevocable by the seller. So the seller now sends you back that offer at 1.1 irrevocable until whatever, 8 p.m. And now you as a buyer have until 8 p.m. to accept that offer. Right. And that that change would take place whether or not it was within the initial irrevocable time frame, anyways. Um, Correct. They would so the way it's worded for those who aren't familiar with it, it says something along the lines of this offer is irrevocable by the blank, which is where you input buyer or seller, depending on who's sending the offer to who, uh, until blank time on blank day of blank month of blank year. So the time and day sometimes change depending on how much time is needed to uh, complete the negotiations. And the buyer seller section will alternate between the two depending on where in the process it is and and they can get messy so sometimes you have to oh yes do a, a new copy at the end it can get very messy depending on how much back and forth you have because on the actual agreement there's not a whole lot of room for all the initials because then any change has to be initialed by all parties um but here's you know in in real life um there's you know the a lot of people don't understand the whole um negotiation part the back and forth part and and you know what happens uh behind the scenes um and and oftentimes we'll have We'll, we'll see a listing and it'll say 24 hours irrevocable required for whatever reason. Maybe they're using it as their advantage to for negotiation purposes. That happens, right? So you get one offer. You ask them to provide a 24-hour irrevocable, a 24-hour expiry on that offer in order to contact any interested parties, any potential other offers, and try and get multiple offers. It could be you have sellers that aren't local. Maybe they're, you know, maybe you have one seller in, well, I just had this a couple of months ago, one seller in BC, one in Dubai, and I'm here in Toronto. So three different time zones. Um, it could be for multitude of reasons that they are requesting that. But even if in the listing it says 24 hour irrevocable required or 24 hour irrevocable, that's oftentimes what it will say. You as a buyer can provide whatever you want. It's an offer. Right. It, it could be 15 minutes. It could be three days. Um, You don't have to follow the rules. Now, there is a bit of a courtesy, right? Because if, in my example, I have a seller in BC, a seller in Dubai, and I'm in Toronto, and we ask for 24 hours in order to facilitate a proper meeting, um, if you, as the buyer or the buyer representative, sends me an offer and it expires in two hours, uh, we're not going to look too fondly at you or your buyers because now you're putting a gun to our head where it's totally impossible. Unless uh, it was obscenely attractive. Well, even then, and maybe, some, maybe we can't get to it, right? Like, Well, if, there's there's can't and, and inconvenient for sure. There's two different scenarios. Right. But I can see somebody who's just in, who really wants a house will make an outrageous what most people may consider to be outrageous offer and in those cases they may come in with a really short ear vocable because they just want to get it wrapped up and they don't want to risk i've done that many times i've done that many times our buyers really want the house and we come in with a guns a blazing offer right like a yeah you really have to be silly to wait until offer night to not accept this one 
And we give them two, three hours. And we say, hey, sorry, we know it's a short irrevocable time and we're not giving you a whole lot and we're holding the gun to your head, but we're doing it purposely because we don't want to get in competition. Right. We know that this offer is going to be hard for you to pass up and we're coming in with our best foot forward. We're giving you a short time because we think we have a, an agreeable de- deal here. So please, you know, consider that and quickly. Right. So that's a good way to represent a buyer is to play, you know, to play it that way, you know, but um, it's from the seller's perspective, quite often those same people, if they do, if you do get that, um, short time frame and an attractive offer, those buyers are likely holding back in many cases. So if you are able to get an extra offer or call their bluff and say, well, listen, well, I just can't get it done in two hours. You're going to have to send me at least, you know, 10 hours or whatever the number is. And you get another offer in, I'd be willing to bet that that person will step up their offer again. So while it may seem attractive, there's still probably money on the table. Yeah. Yes. And no, you can still, I believe, and I don't disagree with you, but I don't completely a hundred percent agree with you because in that short time frame you can still negotiate, right? Yes. So yeah. if that offer is expiring in three hours and this is their best foot forward offer. So let's say the offer is for a million bucks and the most comparable home that sold in the last 30 days sold for 900,000. And that was in a multiple offer situation and they did really well on it. And you're looking at it going, whoa, we have to be silly to pass up on a million bucks. You as the listing agent, you know, you're trying to get as much money for your clients, the sellers as possible. Best month, uh, best price, best deposit, best terms, best conditions. And, um, you know, it's a simple phone call back to that realtor to say, Hey, uh, this is a great offer, but we've got a ton of interest. Um, we'd like to put a deal together today with you in this short time frame. But at this point, we're willing to wait until Sunday. So you can come back with your offer on Sunday or whatever day the offer is. So now you're talking about is, now, well, now on, you're changing on. it up a bit. No, no, no we weren't I'm talking not done. about holding offers, so. Well, that's pretty well commonplace in Canada at the moment, but it doesn't matter. Uh, whatever. We're, we're willing to wait. Um, however, they will sign off right now if you go to a million 30,000. We got a deal at a million 30, whatever that number is, right? So there can still be a negotiation that happens. Yes. Uh, to to really understand if the buyers are at their full all-in number. And that's the key. You just want to make sure that any any offer on the table is the best, is truly the best offer. Insert TikTok troll who now blames real estate agents for increasing prices here. <laughs> yeah. Well, con- excuse me, TikTok troll. That's our job. Well, that's it. But I, my point Sorry. to them is we, on a micro level, we influence prices, but on a macro, it all comes down to supply and demand. Well, it all comes down to the seller. We Brand represent. The buyer. Well, well, sure. But the, you know, the seller is very much in control of that negotiation process. Having a good negotiator represent you is an extremely important part of it. But at the end of the day, if the seller wants to accept the one point or, or the one million and tell us, no, don't piss off the buyers or don't whatever, we don't need that extra 30 grand, uh, which happens. It happens. It happens. I've, I've had sellers tell me, no, that we feel that's being greedy. So don't. Well, not even. Yeah. Sometimes they feel that way. It's being greedy. And sometimes, you know, uh, we, we advise them to go with the lesser offer because of whatever reason it could be there are some red flags or there's, you know, the, the, other, the realtor representing the buyer with the higher offer is not giving us the warm and fuzzies. We have some concerns about how well they actually know their clients, whether or not their clients are is capable financing of closing actually on the deal. in place. Yeah. Is right. financing actually in place? Is this so, deposit like we've seen it all 
we've seen deals that we've accepted where the deposit doesn't come when it's supposed to come. That's a whole other topic uh, episode. Yeah. Topic episode. Well, there was <laughs> one scenario I had with really good clients of ours now, but when the first transaction we did with them, uh, we've done a few since, but the first transaction we did with them, the highest offer of, I think there was eight offers. The highest offer was um, probably like $30,000 higher. And we were already high in our opinion uh, with the other offers, but this one that was quite a bit higher, 30 K or so, there was just something not sitting well with me. So I, I advised them not to take it. And um, as we progressed through the evening, that offer ended up calling me and backing out uh, just as we were agreeing to take another offer. So um, and you got to be but- careful with being greedy because sometimes like if the buyer is truly at their capacity, at their max, they've stretched everything and you're they're up against other offers and you go back to them and you tell them, hey, you know, we need that extra 10, 20, 30 grand to put a deal together and they do it. That could really set in buyer's remorse, right? Like, oh, shit, we overpaid for this house. Yeah. We want out of this. Like, we don't feel like we're getting a deal here. The yeah. deal has to be fair for both sides. Both parties have to feel good about it, right? And and sometimes, um, you know, greed gets in the way. Um, but yeah, you you got to make sure that, you know, when when you're representing a seller as a realtor, you're doing the best to provide them with the best advice, negotiate uh, the best ability um, and price terms, deposit conditions. So anyway, I mean, we're kind of circling around how an irrevocable time is now turning into well we had we uh, negotiation originally i was like well let's talk about these three components of the offer that are often questioned here and you said no let's talk about this one i'm like that's a five minute conversation here we are now 46 minutes into our recording although i'm sure some of that was just us babbling on before we did the intro but you know it's an important discussion it's uh, something that people ask about a lot and um there's a lot of misinformation even among professionals when I use that word lightly. But uh, yeah. Well, I mean, so lesson of today's episode is irrevocable date and time is when that offer actually expires. Uh, as a buyer, you cannot retract the offer during that time. That's the point of having an offer that is legally binding agreement. That is when the offer expires. You're saying to the seller, giving you this amount of time and I am not backing out of the deal during this time. And just know too, the, I'd, say, I'd say the number one reason I get a call from a real estate agent saying, okay, they don't want to, they don't want to do this anymore. They want to back out. They want to withdraw their offer. It's because they were the first offer. Now there's a second offer and they don't want to compete. That's usually when I get that phone call. Um, so no, going into this, if you're a buyer and you're filling out, a purchase agreement. Uh, another offer can come in at any time throughout the process, as throughout your irrevocable period, you're still committed. And now unless you're competing. I'm, I'm going to put the caveat in there. Unless your realtor sat down with you and expl- explained what's happening. Okay. Mr. Seller, Mr. Buyer, or sorry, Mr. Buyer, Mrs. Buyer, or buyers. We are the first offer in. There is a chance other offers will come in. If that happens, did you still feel comfortable in competing with other buyers for this property? Do you want it enough that if we're competing against other buyers that we may have to make adjustments, improvements, whatever, depending on how many offers, if any, there are. Oh, no, no, no. If there's any other offers, you know, we we don't even want to submit the offer if there's other offers. That happens. Buyers say that, which I think is wrong, it's by the way. Because they haven't been educated. They haven't been educated, but it happens. There is a clause 
that can be inserted into the schedules of the agreement <laughs> that says basically this offer is being submitted under the understanding that there are no other offers. If there are other offers, the buyer is entitled to withdraw or replace this offer. I don't think it says withdraw. That's the layman terms. But yes, well, I don't, the, you can I put up. I'm going to look it up while you're talking. I'm going to look it up while I'm talking. I think it's. I think you've got it backwards. There's a, there's a clause mm-hmm. that says this is being submitted under the premise that there, this is competing against other offers. And in the event this one is accepted, the seller will provide proof of such. Yes, there is that one as well. I'm going to look up yours as you talk. Anyway, well, I've got not much else to talk about. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, but that would, that would contradict the irrevocable thing, the irrevocability clause. Under the assumption that it's the only offer. Okay, we're going to have to look at this and bring it up can, in a blog you or can another put a, You can put a clause in there that would state something along the lines of that. You can put a clause into an agreement of whatever you want, as long as the pre-printed stuff is not changing. And even well, that. For sure. But there's, yeah, there's some laws that supersede other laws. So you can insert a no pet clause into a lease agreement. That clause is not valid. It's it's a void clause immediately. Correct. Um, so you can write anything, but you need to know whether or not they are valid. And then, I mean, when you're talking about multiple offer situations that, you know, the whole irrevocable thing is a whole other discussion because as an example, you could be having offer night at 6 p.m. on a Sunday and one, let's say you have 10 offers, you could have an offer expiring at 7 p.m., an offer expiring at 9 p.m., So what happens now if you have 10 offers and the first offer expires at seven? Then you have have nine. Everybody. Now you have nine offers and you got to let those nine offers know there's only nine now. Well, and that's why when you're representing the seller and you are, as an example, let's say you're holding a specific offer night to review offers, you need to be educating the set or informing the buyers, their agents, as to what irrevocable time you want and selling them on the concept of putting in a specific time that you want so that you don't run into that problem. I'm second guessing my, my claw. I'm trying to think of what my clause, did you look it up? No, I stopped, but I, I mean, I have, I have the clauses open here. What would it be referred to as? Oh, you're looking in, in web forums. Oh God, yeah. I don't know. I have, I don't even think I've written one of those clauses to be honest, but um, I'd have to think about that and look we'll bring back. it up and reference it in a, a podcast later yeah. on or another blog or something. I, I will, I will do the due diligence on that, but you're absolutely right. Uh, when it comes to submitting as a part of multiples, um, when you know you're going in with an offer, there is a, and these are, you know, we're talking about pre-printed clauses, essential or uh, predefined clauses that go into a Schedule A. You can change the wording as as a realtor, as a buyer, to accommodate your needs or requests. Um, but that has happened before as well where you submit an offer and there's already another offer on the table and you submit that offer knowing that you are in a multiple offer situation. And now all of a sudden the first offer, to your point, first offer says, Oh, we don't want to compete. You know, we want to pull back out of the deal or pull out our offer or whatever. So can they No, Cause it's irrevocable. Um, but as a seller, you know, do you want to be accepting an offer for somebody that's already backing out before you've accepted it? So, right. so there's all these variables that come. But as a seller's play. realtor, you're leveraging that first offer now to hopefully improve either both or one of them uh, to give your clients a better outcome. 
Well, you've got multiple offers. You've got right. signed irrevocable offers from and, from... and and to the buyer who is contemplating now backing out as the initial first offer, if you... It makes no sense to back out. I mean, the only reasoning I can understand is they don't want to drive up the price, but that doesn't always happen. Your offer may still be the best. So why why not just run with your original plan? Yeah, I never understood that. Nothing to do with irrevocables in this discussion, but I never understood why. But here's, here's and we're going to wrap it up, um, but I, this is something that always baffles me. If you're a buyer and you're the first offer and you submit that offer of a million bucks and we will just say it's a firm deal, no conditions, good deposit, seller's preferred closing date, a million dollars. And now a second offer or a third, there's a couple more offers come in. You were the first, but now there's a couple more offers. Why would you, And this happens all the time. Why would you say, oh, I don't want to compete. I don't want to get in a bidding war. So remove my, I I retract my offer. I don't want to make this offer anymore. I'm not, I'm not interested. You accept it. I'm not even bringing in a deposit. I don't care. You can take me to court, whatever. Right. It happens. Yeah. 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 Why would you just not leave that offer? Because who knows, maybe they'll accept it. If they would have, you know, accept, if you would have been happy that they would have accepted the offer before there were any other offers, why would that change any other time? Right. Well, and also keep in mind that this. There could be 4,000 offers. If mine is still the best, great. Well, and keep in mind this house is the sale of this particular property is now going to set the benchmark for the next one. So whether you pay it now or pay it later, you're paying it. But if you if you can't get over the whole competing concept, then you will inevitably pay more for the house a couple months from now because then you will realize that it's a necessity. Yeah. And I you know, I wonder the whole psychology behind it. Like, are people afraid that if there are other offers, they're going to end up improving their offer to a point that they'll regret? Right. Right? At the end of the day. Oh, no, I'm not going to play that game because I know I'm going to have to. I think that's what goes through people's heads. They believe that they're going to have to make improvements in order to be competitive against the other offers, which may or may not be true. but if but what's the harm in trying? That's right. Like it literally cost you nothing at this point. You've already spent the time in submitting the offer. Yes. Um, so you never know if it's going to get accepted. Anyways, if you have any yeah, just, questions. Just about- one thing, one thing, and it could drag on. We might have to elaborate on in another uh, video, uh, another podcast, but it's relative to this. Is this There's a form um, n- number 244 in Ontario. It's a seller's direction re-property offers. If... Because going back to what we were saying about you can make the irrevocable anytime, even if a seller or a realtor has remarks in the uh, listing saying 24 hours irrevocable, you could still come in with two hours. There is a form that the seller and listing broker brokerage can sign where the seller is saying, I will not, I give the brokerage permission to not convey any information or notification of any offers in any way, shape or form, uh, unless they meet this sort of requirement. And you can specify a date and time at which you will consider them, or you can even specify the amount of hours that are required. Um, And if that's not met, the seller has given the agent permission not to tell them that there's an offer. I'd really love to have a lawyer and a judge uh, a discuss re- discuss this topic with me and with yeah. you because I'll put the asterisks on this form, which are now by the by the way, there are many real estate boards that are requiring this form to be attached to the MLS listing. So we're yes. going to see it more and more, especially across the province of Ontario. Um, 
But that form can be changed by the seller. The seller can change their direction of offers at any time. The seller can do whatever the hell they want. Just it because written, it's, yes, as long as be, it's written. As, as long as it's written and conveyed. So they might say, we're not accepting offers till Sunday. And, you know, me as the buyer's agent, I call the seller's agent. And here's a crazy hypothetical for you. But you're asking a million. And my buyers are willing to pay two million. Verbally, right. I just, you know, you shouldn't be talking about offers verbally, but you're not accepting any offers until Sunday. All right. Well, would two million do it? Yeah, a and, you're like, and you're like, holy crap. So now I call my my sellers and I say, uh, Houston, we might want to consider uh, accepting offers tonight because we got $2 million being talked about and there's enough in whatever, right? There's behind the scenes discussions that could yeah. potentially happen. That form, that direction can be changed by the seller at any time. So I don't know, is there a real purpose to that form or not? And this whole holding offers until Sunday will or will not review preemptive offers. And that even like, that's a whole other podcast discussion right there. Sellers will review offers on Sunday at 6 p.m., but may entertain preemptive offers. Well, and I saw one the other day that I which made a may, TikTok about. Which basically said, means, yeah, go ahead. They said they wrote that, but then afterwards it said, no notice will be given or no notice is required to be given, which means they don't have to, they're saying they don't have to notify other people that have other real estate agents or people that have expressed interest, which I was like, okay, I don't know why on earth you wouldn't, but sure. Well, the only time well, they is wouldn't fact. is if, that is if fact, they actually, yeah, yeah. The seller doesn't have to tell anybody what they're doing and when they're doing. And if they want to accept an offer, they accept an offer. Is it in their best interest? No. Well, they can be sued if they don't. If another agent isn't, if if they've written that offers are being held on Monday at five, oh, and yes. yeah, and if they're not allowing preemptive offers, or no, no, if they're talking are, about if they were, if they were, yes, then they have to inform anybody uh, of a preemptive offer, or sorry, everybody of a preemptive offer. They have to update the remarks in the brokerage listing and inform everybody. And the, the, the only time I see that not happen is usually when the seller, uh, the, the, the real estate agent that's representing the seller also represents the buyer and there's some shady stuff going on. Even, even that is debatable whether they have to or not. No offense. Yes, ethically, you do it. And in representation of the seller, you want to do it. Um, I think it all comes down to if whether goes, or not the seller cares. If it goes to court, I'm telling you right now, if it goes to court in that scenario, seller can accept whatever they want whenever they want. They can, but the seller should have been given the opportunity to make the decision as to whether or not to notify everybody, right? Because they don't know any better. So if you have proof that you've said, hey, we got this really attractive offer. Um, normally That's now true. I would call everybody. Do you want me to do that? And they'll say, no, I like this. Let's move forward with it. Then, you know, there's probably a, you have to convey that information because this, you have to assume the you, seller is naive and knows nothing. That's well, why that, they've hired you. That, that, that becomes your responsibility and representation of the seller. Right. Um, but let's be honest, but it wasn't happening 99.99% of the time. I don't think that discussion happens 99.99% of the time, which is why there's all kinds of gray areas. Um, and and that's why even when things do go to court, um, you have different decisions that are made and different implications. Um, but, you, you know, whether you're a seller or a buyer, you're protecting yourself as, as best as possible. And... As a realtor, whoever you're representing, you know, you want to get the best terms, deal, the best price, the best conditions uh, to best represent your clients. So uh, that's what it is. Anyways, five-minute chat turned into a hour chat. 
episode 164 of KT Confidential, the real estate podcast. Thanks for listening. Smash Thanks the subscribe for watching. button wherever you're watching or listening. Next week, we'll continue on the trend of discussing intricacies of the agreements. I think we're going to talk about holdbacks. Is that what uh, next week's was, episode is? Well, yeah, but again, I'm like, it's a five minute conversation, but here I am thinking the same thing today. Holdbacks. So yes, what is holdbacks. a holdback in a real estate agreement? That will be episode 165. Happy New That's Year. It. Happy New Year. Welcome to 2022.